We are now recording. Let's get the slideshow set up from the current slide. And before we get started on this, if you have any questions, start getting those ready and together. Well, let me make these special assistant projectors trying to wake up again. Did it even? No, it didn't. Well, it yeah. is. Okay, um, my office hours, two changes I know about coming up both of the next two Fridays, tomorrow and next Friday. I um, have treatments both of those Fridays. They say they're going to be about seven hour treatments. They're going to start at 730 in the morning. So it's uh, not good news. Okay, I will not be on campus at all tomorrow or next Friday. Okay either campus. So uh, if you need to see me, catch me Monday through Thursday of next week. Catch me sometime today. All right. Uh, that said, when I got home last night, there was a voice, there was a voicemail on our answering machine that I have a doctor's appointment next Tuesday. I'm not supposed to have a doctor's appointment next Tuesday. So I'm going to call this afternoon. It was too late at night to get them to change, and they're not open yet, or just now opening. So as soon as I, this afternoon when I'm out of class, I'm going to try to call and see if I can get that change, because Fridays is when I want to have my appointments if possible, and uh, Monday or Wednesday afternoon would be better than any time on Tuesday or Thursday. So I'll see if I can get that changed. But stand by. This is one time you might want to check. Uh, blackboard, I mean, check, uh, yeah, blackboard before coming to class. If, if I cannot get that appointment changed, I can't remember what time the appointment was. It seemed like it was 8.30, so that would be the problem. So, uh, but I'm going to try to get that changed. Mari? Yeah, we'll see you in that light. Okay. Any questions for anything we've covered so far? Let me also say this. Diamonds here. Uh, the tests, several people have been completing those. If you haven't either started the test or completed the test, please do so as soon as possible because we are moving right along. He is here. Okay. Oh, good deal. And papers in. Excellent. Okay, another one. Wow. Okay, the flood started. Come on. Okay. Okay. Two in a day. That's not bad. Okay. What's that? Yeah. And yeah. Okay. Get it in today. You get two. It's still October. Okay. Okay. All right. I hadn't thought of that. This is probably the last day of yeah, the month we'll be here. No? Yeah, that's right. Oh, the Tuesday, Thursday. Now, since, what, the 31st is Monday, you can still get it in Monday. Isn't it the 31st Monday? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, still a chance for November. You got the weekend. Use it. Okay. All right. So, the other thing I was saying, please get your test completed. We're moving right along toward the next quiz, so not going to be too long. So, no questions on anything we've covered so far? Well, where my mark was for today is on page 128, and uh, I thought we had done this one or one like it. Oh, here's Jessica. There's two. Okay. All right. Now, what we were talking about before was basically talking about characteristics of functions. The section we're in is finding the zeros of functions, but with the zeros come other things. For instance, this function, f of x equals minus 2x to the fourth minus 2x squared. First thing to look for there, well, several things. Let's just review all of it. What is one thing you know about this function? When you look at it, what do you tell me about this graph? 
It's an even function. That's very good because both of the exponents are even. You don't have any odd exponents. Okay, and it's going down and down. Why? Okay, number one, the leading exponent is even, so it's going the same direction, and the negative coefficient means that direction is down. Very good. Okay, how many, yeah? Ah, uh, actually, possibly four intercepts. And what's another name for intercept? You were talking x intercepts. Zeros of the function. Okay? Possibly four. Okay? Don't have to have four. The maximum you could have is four. When you look at this graph, what do you notice? Only three, but can you tell me anything about this one? Okay, here is something we haven't hit yet, so I'm going to suggest it here. Notice at this zero, the function crosses the x-axis. At this zero, it crosses the x-axis. At this zero, it comes down and then goes up. It touches, you might say kisses the x-axis, but then turns back and goes in the same direction. When you see that happening, you know that's got to be a multiple zero. In fact, its multiplicity has got to be even. These that cross, one and only one zero, that's a multiplicity that's odd, okay? And we'll look at that a little bit later, but I just want to point it out now. What else do you notice about this? Hint, hint, hint. Okay, how many maximum turning points could this one have? Three, one less than the degree, and how many does it have? Three, so sure enough, that fits, okay? So that's the situation for this one. In this case, the graph of F has three turning points, as shown here, because you could have up to three, and it, indeed it does. Now, just visualize this. If you were to add a one or seven or something like that to that, what's going to happen to that function? Up, exactly. And if it goes up anywhere, okay, even 0.5 or 0.3 or 0.1, this is no longer a zero because now the whole function, remember it's a rigid translation, it goes up, this one's no longer zero. You still have zero somewhere out here, but you don't have one there anymore. Then you would be down to two zeros. Now, what if this had a minus 3 or minus 1 or minus 17? Well, 17 wouldn't be too good. Actually, minus 3 wouldn't be too good. Minus 0 0.1, we'll put it that way. What's that function doing now? It goes down a little bit, and as it does, this minimum goes down here, which means it crosses there and there and still crosses there. Now, let's say it went down 1. So it was a minus 1. So this goes down to here. These things don't even reach. How many zeros you have then? None. Okay? So this one function, here it happens to have three zeros. Drop it just a little bit, and you get four zeros. Raise it a little bit, you get two zeros. Drop it even further, you get zeros. No zeros. Okay? So you see, all it would take was putting a constant out here slightly uh, or any positive drops it to two zeros a small negative makes it have four zeros a larger negative has zero zeros no zeros all right that was more than they asked for but there's no extra charge okay now this example that we just showed note that because the exponent is greater than one the factor uh, of, of this factor, and let's see. I can't remember if we did this before. Let's go back to here. And if we were analyzing this function, y'all have done a good job. You picked out all the key features. But what would be the first thing? Let me, since it's in blue, I think I will, yeah, stay in blue. Looks like it's light blue. What's one of the first things you would do to that? analyze the function, as in finding its zeros. 
Is that good? Okay, so that equal to zero. Perfect. Okay. And then what would you do next? Factor it. And what, how would you factor that? Negative 2 x squared. Feel like I'm pulling teeth. And what would you have left? x squared. A little louder? No, because you pulled out the minus sign, that makes that a minus. See, the minus sign out front changes the sign of both of those. Minus 1. Are you through factoring? No. What else? And that's equal to 0, by the way. Negative 2x squared. X, okay, I put plus first. X plus 1 times X minus 1. In whichever order, it doesn't matter which order you write it. Okay? Now, you could have done one more thing if you felt like, and yeah, we did this last time. We did factor it. Remember? Now, to find the zeros, you set each of those factors equal to zero, right? Negative 2, x squared equals zero, or x plus 1 equals zero, or x minus 1 equals zero. What does the first one give you? x equals 0, okay? Divide out minus 2, it disappears, and then x times x equals 0. Either x is 0, but because there's two of them, because that exponent is 2, that's what makes this a multiplicity of 2. It has 2, and therefore it turns there and doesn't cross the x-axis. Each of these, this gives you what? When you solve this equation, x equal negative 1 and x equal positive 1. Those are those zeros, but those are single zeros. They cross, they don't pause, they don't do anything, they just cross them. This one, because it's a multiple and it's even, it comes down and acts like it's going to cross, turns around and goes back up. That's why it's a double zero. And that's what would happen if you drop this just a little bit. Sure enough, it would be two zeros right there. Right? Okay, good deal. And that's what they're talking about here. In example three, note that because the exponent is greater than one, that factor, negative 2x squared, yields a repeated zero at x equals zero. Okay? It's x equals zero and x equals zero. And that's how I did it the first time I did it last Tuesday. Now here's the the box, okay, that focuses on that. Repeated zeros, a factor, x minus a, now this one we had x minus zero, so that made a zero. x minus a raised to the kth power, anytime k is greater than one, that yields a repeated zero, x equal a, because you set that equal to zero, solve for that, you get x equal a of a multiplicity k. Okay, that's what I was talking about before. In this case, the multiplicity is 2. Now, two points here. When that k is odd, now they say k has to be greater than 1. Say it's 3, 5, 7, 15, you know, 85, whatever it is. Okay, when it's odd, the graph crosses the x-axis at x equal a. Now, I'll tell you in a minute. I think we'll show you in a minute what. But if that k is even, like here, or 4, or 6, or 12, or 18, or whatever, then the graph touches the x-axis, but does not cross it, and it goes back in the same direction it was coming from before. But it does that at x equal a. So that's what we mean by multiplicity. If one of your factors, or more than one of your factors, has an exponent that is uh, greater than 1, then you have a multiplicity of that exponent. If that's an even exponent, it doesn't cross. Odd exponent, it does. I think we're going to hit a couple of examples of that. Let's see. Yeah. To graph a polynomial functions, use the fact that the polynomial function can change signs only at its zeros. Now, why is that true? What were the two features of a polynomial function? 
jazz. Smooth and say again. Okay, no points. That means it's smooth. Okay, no angles, cusps, things like that. What's the other one? It's also continuous, smooth and continuous. Okay. So therefore, since it's a smooth continuous function, the only time that function can change signs, the f, the y, change signs is that somewhere in between there you have a zero. So that's only going to happen at the zeros. Now, it will always happen at a zero, because if you have an even multiplicity, it won't change signs there. Okay, between two consecutive zeros, now then you have to line up all your zeros, a polynomial must be either entirely positive or entirely negative. Because if there's a consecutive zeros, it can't have another zero in between. So it's going to stay positive or stay negative one or the other, okay? So these are little features that help you when you're graphing. And that's what we love to do, right? Or at least the book does, okay. That means that when you put the real zeros of a polynomial function in order, good idea, they divide the real number line into intervals on which the function has no sign changes, okay? Here's what we're talking about, all right? We found the zeros, didn't we? X equals zero, X equals minus one, X equals one. Now, if you put those in order, it's X equals minus one, X equals zero, X equals one. Put them in there. Minus one, zero, one. Those are your three zeros. That's all you got. To the left of minus one, we know where it's going because we determined that early on. This was a down, down. So we know it's going down there. That's multiplicity of one, so it's going to cross. So it has to be positive after that. And it's going to be positive until it hits that next zero, which is this one. Okay? It's got to be positive strictly in between those two zeros. Now, because this is a multiplicity of zero is a multiplicity of Two, okay, then it's not going to cross. So that means it stays positive. It gets to zero, but then it goes positive again because it doesn't cross the axis. Then when it re so it stays positive between zero and one, between these two zeros, okay? Then what? F1, what kind of zero is that? Yeah, it, it's a multiplicity of one, you might say. It doesn't, is in its odd, so it's going to cross there, and it keeps heading south. But that's where we knew it was going to go because of the negative exponent and an even function. So you see, everything fits. Everything fits here. All right. Any questions about that? That's what this statement was saying. It divides the x-axis, uh, the real number line, into intervals and you know that there's no sign changes outside or in between those intervals. The resulting intervals are called test intervals, in which you can choose a representative x value to determine whether the value of the polynomial function is positive, that means the graph lies above the x-axis, or negative, meaning it lies below. Did we do any test points? No, we, knew, we used what we knew about end behavior and about multiplicity, whether it crossed or not, and we can tell exactly where those were going to go. But if you don't know that for sure, you're a little in doubt, pick a value, any value in those test intervals, and that'll tell you where the function is there, and between those zeros, it's got to stay on that side of the x-axis. All right. Now, they move on to intermediate value theorem, skipping the two examples that illustrate what they were just talking about. Shame on them. Okay? Let's do them here. That's about the most room we got on anything. Let's do example four. Okay? We did example three. Let's do four. Sketch the graphs of... Whoops. Let me get out of light blue and go back to black. Okay. Sketch the graph of f of x is equal to 
3 x to the fourth minus 4 x cubed. Okay? Now I'm going to draw the graph, or at least uh, my axes. Okay? Hope that'll be sufficient. Hope so. Okay. I'll even put a few tick marks on it. Tick, 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 tick. Tack, tack. Oops. The negatives go in the opposite direction. Okay. Okay, not very evenly spaced, but you can live with it, right? Yes? Okay. Now, you tell me what you see in that function that will help you graph. What would be positive? Oh, the leading coefficient is positive. Good idea. Good science. What? Going up and up because... This is an even exponent with a positive coefficient. The leading term. I call it a leading term test. The book calls it leading coefficient test. Leading term test. Even exponent, positive coefficient. The end behavior is on the up and up. Okay? It's going up this way somewhere and up that way somewhere. That's what's going to happen for large x's. Somewhere out there, it's going to always go to up. Good. What's the next thing you can tell me about this one? Is what? Okay, at maximum it could have four zeros. It may not have them, but at maximum it would. And, and maximum of three turning points. It may not have them, but that's the maximum it could have. Well, you got to almost get a few points on here before you can. So what else? Uh, uh, how do you know that? What we better do first is your F word. Ah, let's factor first, and then we'll talk about that. So, well, before you do that, you probably need, if you're looking for zeros, you set it equal to zero. Okay, now you factor. And what would you see is the greatest common factor? X cubed times 3X. Minus 4 equals 0. Okay, you want to revise your multiplicity? What would you go from there? What's the next thing? Either x cubed is equal to 0 or 3x minus 4 is equal to 0. Well, this would be what? x equals 0 with a multiplicity of? Three. What does that tell you? Is that graph going to cross the axis there or touch the axis there? Huh? No, because it's an odd multiplicity, it's going to cross. Okay? And that's an x equals zero. The y is going to be zero. That's what we set it as. So right there, we're going to cross. Now, we don't know which way it's crossing yet, but we'll get there. Okay? What's our next thing we're going to do? How about this other zero? What's it? Help me, help me. How would you find that zero? I add four to both sides and divide by three. Three x equal four. Divide by three, and that gives you x equal four thirds. Where in the world is four thirds? One and one third. So there's your other zero. So whereas we had a maximum of four zeros, we wound up with only two because this has a multiplicity of three. Right? All right. So that means there can't be any more zeros out here. So this function, since it's going to be going up, ultimately it's going to have to be coming down this way here because it's going up that, going that way, down here. Now, since that's a multiplicity of 3, this is what I'm going to show you. It doesn't just do a straight cross there like it would if it was a multiplicity of 1, which really isn't multiplicity. What it does, it comes down 
probably pretty quickly because x cubed comes down quickly, and then it sort of acts like a cubic. It bends, but it still crosses. That's what happens. It's like a cubic function. It has that little bend to it, but it's kind of come right back up and hit that multiplicity, I mean that zero, and then it's going up and not coming down again. Keeps going, keeps trucking. That's it. Now that's probably not a very pretty picture of it, but that's how it's going to look. Now, those two zeros broke the number line into how many regions? Three. You got one on this side, one in between, and one on that side. Now, if you wanted to check to see if my reasoning was right, you could pick any number to the left of this zero. What would be an easy one? Negative one. Okay, so let's pick negative one and see what happens. Now, the other point, by the way, and I usually always do this. This one's a little silly this way. But the other thing is that you got your two x-intercepts. What might you look for? You got two x-intercepts. Next thing to look for would be your y-intercept. How do you get that? Set x equal 0. Well, guess what happens if you set x equal 0? It's 0. So we've already got our y-intercept right there. How many y-intercepts can you have? One and only one because it's a vertical line. And the vertical line says, test says you can only have one. So you could have multiple x-intercepts, but you can only have one y. You may not always have it, but in this case you do. Polynomial functions, you will always have it. But since you found this to be 0, 0, that's both an x-intercept and a y-intercept. So we really didn't need to do that. But I always like to do it anyway when they're more complicated functions than this. So let's choose x equal negative 1. What will this become? Negative 1 to the fourth power is? 1. 3 times 1 is 3. Okay. Negative 1 to the third power is? Negative 1 times negative 4 is? Positive 4. So 3 plus 4 is? 7. So this should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It should be off a little bit. should be right there. But you see? Yeah. Going in the right direction. Positive here. It's got to be positive everywhere to the left of 0. Okay? The next interval was between 0 and 1 and a third. What's a good convenient number in between that? 1. So let's plug it in and see what we get. 3 is 3 minus 4 is negative 1. I didn't go far enough down, did I? Okay. Now, I've got the shape right, but I just didn't get quite the dimensions right. This should be down here. So this is coming down down here and maybe going back up, something like that. But at negative 1, I mean at positive 1, it is a negative 1. But basically that's, oh, yeah, we could try one on the outside. What's a good value on the outside of that last 0? 2. Let's try it. Anyone know what 2 to the 4th is? Uh, 8 is 2 to the 3rd. 16. 3 times 16? Big numbers. 48. Minus, and what is uh, 2 cubed? I just said. 8. 48. And what's 4 times 8? 32. So it's positive 48 minus 32. 16. Okay, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm way off here. Because that'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten. somewhere way up there. So I've got this sort of, that should be going much steeper. <laughs> but you see, I've got the general idea. Okay? That's what it looks like, basically. If you look in the book, their picture maybe isn't quite as pretty as mine, but look at that. They got it too. See how steep it's going up there? All right, good deal. And they blow up the zeros there so you can see this is a single zero just crossing the x-axis this is a multiplicity of three which means it comes down hangs around zero but still crosses okay 
So the higher multiplicity, the longer it hangs there. Well, we saw that in our functions, remember? The bigger the exponent, the longer it hangs near zero. Okay. We're used to that. All right. Any questions on that? That was example four. Okay. Now they had the little steps, apply the leading term test, I call it. Find the real zeros, we did. Plot a few extra points, we did, but we didn't have to. Uh, we drew the graph. We drew it early and then just checked our points. All right. The polynomial function is in standard form. Why didn't they have this on the slide? I don't know. Uh, when its terms are in descending order of their powers, right? When the exponents are in descending order, okay? Uh, from left to right. That's how we're used to writing. Before applying the leading term test, I like to call it, to a polynomial function, good idea to make sure the polynomial is in standard form. Otherwise, you might pick out the wrong leading term and have it going in the wrong directions. So let's do the next one, which uses that hint. Sketch the graph of this one. f of x is equal to negative 2x cubed. plus 6x squared. Yeah, they have this in the right order, so what were they talking about? Minus 9 halves x. Any of you ready to throw up your hands and say, I can't do this, I got fractions? Don't. You know, keep your hands down. Okay, unless you're answering your question. Okay, or asking a question. Okay. So I sketch the graph. What's the first thing? You, oh, let me draw, let me draw the graph in here or at least the axes, vertical axis, horizontal axis, okay? I'll put a few tick marks in here. Okay. What are some things you note about this function? Okay. Okay, a little louder. Okay. I think you said it right, I just can't hear well. Okay, both of them? Why not? What is the degree of this? Three. Ah, meaning they're going in opposite directions. So they both won't be going down. One will be going down. That's the question. Which one? Ah, uh, okay. The one that way, because normally that would be going up, but because of minus sign, it's going down. So, yeah, this is going up to the left and down to the right. Okay. Good deal. That's our, and you see why? Odd exponent, leading, leading term has odd exponent. I mean, they've got to be going in opposite directions. This flips them over. So the negative is going positive and the positive is going negative. Okay. Good deal. What next? Pretty exciting stuff in here. Okay. Okay. You might have a maximum of three zeros and? And two turning points. We forgot to go back and check that last one. Is that already a right? Yeah, I already erased it. But if you think about it, it only had two zeros when it could have had four. And it, when it comes down like it did there and do that, that's not really a turning point. It tried to be, but then it went on down anyway. It only, only has one. one turning point. Exactly. Okay. This one could have how many? Two. May not, but we could have two. Next. Next step. Factor, well, set it equal to zero in factor, okay? And what does that factor as? Now, I'm going to cheat some. Is that okay? Okay. No, you can't cheat. Oh, I've got it. Okay. Now, what's the one thing you might not like about this? That fractional coefficient. So I want to get it on the outside if possible. Now, this is going to take some thinking, but I think we can do that. So whatever we take out there, let's make sure it's got a half in it. 
And that may be all that we do. You want that to be the only thing? There's no common factors, n numerical factors. Take out negative, negative okay, well, no, yeah, I would take out negative half. That's a good idea. A negative one half. And what else? What other common factor do you see? X. The X, exactly. So let's take out, now this is really stretching it some, take out a negative one half X. Okay? Now, what do you have left? Say again? Say again? Uh, well, certainly you're going to have an x squared, but you got a coefficient too. And think of it this way. What is it that when you multiply it by negative one half, you're going to get a negative two? What could you put here that when you multiply by negative one half times whatever you put there, you go to negative two? Four, good, yes, okay, okay. Do you see why that works? Now, it works for two reasons. Number one, because it works. Negative one half of four is negative two, right? So that gives you the right answer. But what are you doing when you're factoring? You're dividing. And if you divide negative two by negative one half, that's what you're doing. Go over to the side and do that. Divide negative two, I can't write. Okay, negative 2 divided by negative 1 half. Number 1, what's your answer going to be sign-wise? <laughs> positive. When you multiply or divide negative, two negatives, you're going to get a positive. So let's just get rid of that for right now. And then how do we divide fractional form? Multiply by the reciprocal. Exactly. So that's the same as 2 times 2 over 1. And guess what that is? Four. That's where it came from. But, if you told her to go through all that, just think, what number could that be? Okay? Same thing here. Now, you factored out a minus, and you notice it changed the sign of that term. What's it going to change to do to this term? Change it. Yeah, make it negative. Change its sign as well. It's what negatives do. They change things. Okay? Now, what, what will that be then? A little louder? Okay, let's see if 3x would work. Negative 1 half times 3 would be not positive 6. What would you have to have here for negative 1 half times this would give you 6? 12, very good, okay? 12. And you can go up and do the same thing. It's 6 divided by negative 1 half is 6 times a negative 3. Okay, so that would be, I think, a, a negative 2. That would be a 12. 12x, factored out the x, okay? And then, how about that last one? First, it's sine. Second, plus, very good. You factored out the one half, what do you have left? Just look at it. Nine. Okay. And that's equal to zero. You see how that works? You agree with that? All right, good deal. Are you through factor? No. So what might this next one factor as? This is why it was a good idea to get that negative out of the way and also get the fraction out of the way. So negative one-half x times how will this factor? Will it? That's the big question. Will that factor? You don't think so, okay? Too bad, okay. Okay? Now, what do you notice? Good thing to notice about this term and that term. They're both. Say again? Yeah, they're both positive. That's a good thing to notice. And they are perfect squares. So, what might we try? Yes, let's try 2x. What sign? Minus 3 times a 2x minus 3. Let's see if that works. First, 2x times 2x. 4x squared, that works. 2x times minus 3 is? Minus 6x. Minus 6x, that goes to? Minus 12x and? Plus 9, yes it does. Okay? Now, 
I don't know if this is helpful, but it gets it into the form we've seen before. That'd be minus one half x times two x minus three squared is equal to zero. I don't usually do that, but because the book had mentioned that, what does this tell you? This has a, what is the zero here? I like it in the previous one. First, what does, let's go back to this, okay? What does that tell you? So each of those equal to zero, right? And you get negative one-half x equals zero, or 2x minus 3 is equal to zero, or 2x minus 3 is equal to zero. Guess what? That's redundant, isn't it? Okay? What does that tell you? You have a multiple zero. And what multiplicity? Two. Okay? All right. But let's find out what the zeros are. What's that first one? Multiply both sides of the equation by a negative 2. That goes to 1. You have x equal 0, of course. Okay? And what does the next one tell you? Add 3 to both sides. And that gives you 2x is equal to 3. Yes, I heard someone say 3 halves. Divide by 2 x equal 3 halves. And the other one gives you x equal 3 halves. So guess what? That's a double zero at x equal 3 halves. Where is 3 halves? I know where 0 is. That's that one. And what kind is that? Single multiplicity, meaning it's gone across there, right? Straight across, you know, no lingering, okay? And the next one, where is 3 halves? 1 and a half. Right there. What's it going to do there? What's it not going to do there? Cross. It's going to go back in the same direction. So since you know it's got to be going positive up here, it's going to cross positively here and just go straight across. And then it's going to come back up here somewhere and try to cross but not do it, and it's going to go down. That's how it looks. Okay? We were expecting up to how many zeros? Three. We wound up with two, but this is a double zero. So you could almost count it twice. That's how you get it. There's only one zero. And how many turning points were we expecting to have? Two. And how many we get? Two. Okay, so that part works out really nice. All right. Now, if you weren't sure of if I have my graph situated quite right, what could you do? Test points, exactly. Now, what might you choose as test points? Name them. Negative one, one, two. Yeah, let's try those. So when x is equal to negative one, hmm, okay, let's do this here then. This would be negative two, and what's negative one cubed? negative 1 plus 6 times what's negative 1 squared? 1 minus 9 halves times negative 1. I can just write that down. So this is going to be positive. That's going to be 2. That's going to be positive plus 6. That's going to be positive plus 9 halves, right? So 9 halves is 3 and a half. So that's 8 plus 3 and a half. That's 11 and a half. 1, 2, 3, I hit 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I don't even have it on the scope. It's way steeper than what I did. But not much, a little bit. Okay? How about this at 1? Let's do that one. Alpha of 1 would be, this is really easy. What do you do? Negative 2 plus 6. Minus 9 halves. Guess what you do? Every polynomial function, every polynomial function, when x is 1, every multiple of 1 is 1. So you just write down the coefficients and add them together. Okay? For negative 1, 
you write down the coefficients, but you change the signs of the odd ones that leave the even the same sign. Now that's a little difficult, but you know, yeah, that's exactly what you do. So this is odd, that's odd, so you change those to plus, this one is even, so you leave it plus, okay? But this is going to be uh, minus 2 plus 6 is plus 4, minus 3 and a half, no, 4 and a half. Whew, I can't add. 4 and a half, so that's going to be plus 4, minus 4 and a half. That's going to be a negative 1 half here. So I don't, I'm not far off, but a little bit. I went down a little too far, okay, and comes back up here and goes down. Okay, how about our negative 2? This one we're actually going to have to work for it. F of negative 2 is equal to negative 2 times what's negative 2 cubed? Negative 8, okay? Plus 6 times what's negative 2 squared? Second? Positive 4. Uh, minus 9 halves times a minus 2. Okay, what's that going to give us? There is something wrong with my picture. Okay. Whoa, hold it here. Those come out positive, and we got negative. I've done something stupid wrong here. Oh, I put in a negative 2. That's a positive 2. Why did you let me do that? It was your fault. Okay. Okay. That's a positive 8. That's a positive, and that's a positive. Okay. Now let's do it. Okay. What does that give you? Negative 16 plus 24 minus 9. Okay, because the 2s go out there. Okay, so that's going to be minus 25 plus 24. That's going to be a minus 1. That's where that one should have gone. Oh, I almost had it on that second curve. So that's what it looks like. Sure enough, that's what it's doing. In behavior work, see, when I saw my in behavior wasn't working, I knew I made a mistake. Because we got that right. I put in the minus 2 and it should have been the plus 2. Good deal. All right, and if you look in the book, pretty close to what they got. They may not be quite as neat as ours, but they did okay. By the way, both of those had checkpoints. Good idea to go home, go to the library, go to the classroom, do something and do your checkpoints. All right, any questions? We call those test intervals we did at the end, okay? Now, we're going to talk about a very famous theorem in mathematics. It's the intermediate value theorem. We've actually talked around it, uh, but we're actually going to do it now. You may not realize we talked about it. The intermediate value theorem implies that if you have two points on a graph, x equal a, what would the y value be? We were just doing this. y is... Oh, you haven't forgotten that already, have you? What is y always equal to? Alpha of x. And if x equal a, then y would be? Alpha of x or f of a, right? If x equal a, y would be f of a, right? Okay? And if x equal b, y would be f of b. Okay? So it implies that if you have these two points, wherever those two points are, are two points on a graph of a polynomial function, as long as the f of a and f of b are not the same. They've got to be different. One's greater than the other, one's less than the other. doesn't matter where. Then for any number b in between f of a and f of b, say f of a is up here, f of b is down here, they just can't be the same. So for any number d that's in between f of a and f of b, somewhere in here, there must be a number C on the x-axis between A and B such that alpha C is equal to D. Don't you love letters? 
They make a lot of such colors. Let's see what it is. Here's, I was waving my arms. They've actually drawn a picture here. What if alpha of A is, here's A, there's alpha of A. Here's B, there's alpha B. Okay, they drew, there's the alpha B is greater than alpha of A. It just can't be equal to. Now, for any value D that's in between alpha of A and alpha of B, there's got to be some point on the x-axis between A and B so that alpha C is equal to that value D. Why is that true? No. Yes, you do. What are two features of a polynomial function? Smooth. Now, the smoothness has no bearing here, but continuous. It has to be. If this is f of A here, f of B there, there's got to be some place on the x-axis between A and B where you're going to be C, because it's continuous. There's no jumps. There's no holes. There's no gaps. It's got to be. This comes from the fact that polynomial functions are always continuous. You've got to have a value. Every value in between f of A and f of B has to be on that graph in between, and if it is, that means there's some value C such that that's true because they're continuous functions, okay? So here's how we state it. Let A and B be any real numbers as long as A is less than B. Okay, can't be the same. And you don't want A to be greater either. If F is a polynomial function, smooth and continuous, such that F of A is not equal to F of B, if they were then, you know, don't go there, okay? But if they aren't equal to each other, then somewhere in the interval between A and B, F takes on every value between F of A and F of B. That may take on a few values outside of that, but it's got to take on every value inside. Here's what I'm saying about it could take on some outside. Let's take this here and say this graph was really doing this. Okay? It still takes on every value between F of A and F of B. In fact, it may take them on more than once. I think that only takes them once. But uh, it does some on the outside, too. That's okay. But it takes on every value in between. Got to. No matter how many wiggles and squiggles, because they're continuous function, it's going to have every value in between. Now, the intermediate value theorem helps you locate real zeros of a polynomial function this way. If you can find a value, x equals a, in which the polynomial function, say, is positive, and then later you find another value, x equals b, but the polynomial function is negative, the y is negative, guess what? You got a zero somewhere in between because it's a continuous function. Then you can conclude that the function has at least one. It may have seven zeros in between that, but at least one real zero in between those two values because, got to, because of the intermediate value theorem. And it goes the other way, too. If f of a is negative, f of b is positive, got to be at least one zero in between them. And that's helpful because not all functions come out easy to define answers, okay? For instance, this one. The function f of x is equal to x cubed plus x squared plus 1, okay? Can you factor that? You can? Congratulations. Oh, I can. Okay, not, not practical. Okay? In fact, even if that had been a 2, 1 in the 1, not practical. But at least you can use quadratic formula. This one can't even use that. Okay, so what you have to do here is just start picking some values. Now, what's a really easy value to pick for that x? Zero. I love it. Okay? And that gives you. At f of 0, you get how much? 1. Okay. That's a positive value. Now, guess what? Any positive value is still going to be greater than 1, right? Any positive value is going to be even greater. So that's going to be a bigger positive number. It's going to be a bigger positive number. And add 1 to it, it'll be a bigger positive number. So you're not going to get any negatives going that way, right? So let's come this way. What happens if you put a minus 1 in here? That's a minus 1. This is a plus 1, and this is a plus 1. So you still pass. So that wasn't big enough. So how about a negative 2? 
That'll be a negative 8. Plus 4, plus 1. That'll be plus 5. That'll give you a negative 3. Ding, 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 ding. You had to have a 0 somewhere between minus 2 and minus 1. Got to. Okay? No way around it. Okay? Because x, the, the f of x is negative down here, positive up there. How did we know if you went far enough that way you're going to get a negative number? In behavior. What does that tell you? Going down to the left, up to the right, got to have a zero somewhere in there. Hint, hint. Any odd, any function whose uh, leading, leading term is an odd degree always is going to have at least one zero. Always. Now, the evens you can't tell. The odds, you know you've got to have at least one. You may have a bunch. You've got to have at least one. So it follows from the intermediate value theorem, there must be a real zero somewhere between minus x equal minus 2 and x equal minus 1. Now, how do you go about finding that? Well, if you hang on and take calculus, you'll find some really easy ways to do it. Without taking calculus, you're going to have to work for it. Well, I love calculus. It takes some of the work out of it. Okay? But, what you're going to have to do, what value might you choose between minus 2 and minus 1? Negative 1 and a half, exactly. Negative 3 halves, however you want to say that. That's negative 1.5, by the way. Plug that into your calculator, see what you get. Anyone got a calculator? Yeah, negative 1 cubed. I mean, negative 1.5 cubed plus 1.5 squared plus 1. What you get? My calculator is off the whole time. It's what? My calculator turned off the whole time. Okay, well then turn it off and type it in again. Okay? All right. Difficult problems here. Okay. I've done that too. Okay. Negative 1.5 cubed plus 1.5 squared plus 1. Negative 4.6. That doesn't sound right. Negative 1.5 cubed plus negative 1.5 squared plus 1. Negative 4.6. Okay. I think you entered that. Okay. okay. What you did was minus a 1.5 squared. This should be in a. Okay, wait, 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 wait. I'm going to show you what we did. Can you get back to that? Can you get back to what? To the place you wanted. Okay, got it. Got it. Got it. I have to enter it all again. Okay. Now, here's what technically what you should do. Oh, yeah. By the way, everybody, when you're doing this, make sure your number that you're cubing or squaring is in parentheses. Negative 1.5 in parentheses cubed. Because what he did was minus 1.5 cubed, which cubes first and then negate. Negative 0.125. Ah, that sounds much better. Negative 0.125. Well, this was a negative 1. That was a, I'm sorry, that's a positive 1 and a negative 3. Negative 1, negative 0.125, is that what you said? Okay, that's somewhere right up around there, okay? So guess what? You're still slightly negative, but you're not nearly as negative as you were at negative 3. I mean, you're really close, okay? That's negative 1 eighth, by the way. Okay, now, where would you choose next? Something between negative 1.5 and negative 1. Now, I'm looking at this. I think I'll do negative 1.4. Okay, let's see if we can get positive there. To do that, in parentheses, open parentheses, negative 1.4, close parentheses, cubed, plus open parentheses, negative 1.4, close parentheses, squared, plus 1. Ah, so that's positive, right? 
So then now you're on the positive side. So now what we need to do is go back something in between negative 1.5 and negative 1.4. What might you choose? Negative 1.45. How about that? Yeah, I mean, you actually want to go even more negative, like negative 1.47 or something like that. But pick something. Be sure you put them in parentheses, but are you using that one or another one? Okay. You just keep doing, narrow down, get one on the plus, one on the negative, pick something in between. One positive, one negative, get something in between. Yeah. Keep doing it until you narrow it down. You're going to get an answer that you guys, you know what? I call this method the method of exhaustion. Actually, I didn't come up with that. Archimedes did on a different thing. But, you know, you just keep doing so. Okay, that's close enough. I'll take that as an answer. I'm tired of doing this, okay? You know it's something between negative 1.4 and negative 1.5. Let's see what they say in the book. Do they say in the book? They just say you continue doing it, but they don't give you an answer, okay? But you just keep doing it like we did. Now, once you get to calculus, there's much, much easier ways to do it. All right. Example six, I think that's the next one here, isn't it? Yeah. Last one, too. Use the intermediate value theorem. Let's see if they got it in here. Okay, wait. By continuing this line of reasoning, you can approximate any real zeros of a polynomial function, any desired accuracy, but just finding something whose y values are across the x, like one positive, one negative, pick some x in between those, so, and then try again. And then if it goes, yeah, keep going in between. So we're going to illustrate that in example six. Use the intermediate value theorem to approximate the real zero. They say only say one, so we'll just go for one. Where would you begin? Begin easy. If x equals zero, what is your y? One, okay? So we know that f of zero is equal to one. Everybody see why that's true? Okay. Pick me another x. I don't care. Okay, how about one? f of one is equal to? Say again? One also. That's not going to help too much. So let's do one. Nah. I think we need to go in the other direction. f of minus one. What would that give us? Say again? Okay. Negative one cubed is? Negative one minus a negative one squared is? One plus one. Yeah, that's going to be negative. That's going to be a minus one. So we know we're something in between zero and minus one. What's a good value to choose? Negative one half. Negative one half. So let's try alpha of negative 0 0.5. And what does that give you? So we're not using that one at all. Plug it in, plug it in. Be sure you put parentheses around it. Negative, open parentheses, negative 0 0.5, close parentheses, cubed, minus open parentheses, negative 0 0.5, close parentheses, squared, plus 1. What does that give you? Anybody? Lazy people. Only one calculator in the room? Ooh, what if I gave you a pop test today? Wouldn't y'all be hurting, huh? Well, maybe we do, should do it by hand, okay? What does that give you? thought the black box would speed things up a little. Positive? Okay, that's in between minus 1 and 1, so I'll believe that. But that's still positive. So now we want to do something between these two. So between point, negative point 0.5 and negative point 0.1, you pick it. Negative 0 point between point 0.5 and 1. How about, yeah. Point 0.6, is that what you said? Okay, let's try point 
easy enough for you. So you don't have a calculator. Okay, <laughs> okay. get it out and do it. Okay, what do you get? This is almost as exciting as watching water boil, isn't it? Yeah. No problem. Also positive, 0.424. But see, we're getting closer to zero, aren't we? So now let's go between this one and that one, between negative 0.6 and negative 1. Just keep going, okay? We'll pretend that we've kept going, all right? And after a while, they get negative 0.7. Okay, negative point eight would give you a negative number. Negative point seven would be a positive number. So something in between there, you just keep trucking, and it doesn't actually give you an answer, but it, something between negative point seven and negative point eight. All right, that finishes the section. Homework exercises: I would do all of nine through fourteen, but check the odd answers in the back. Do any of the? Do either fifteen or seventeen, or both. Any of the odds, 19 to 29, either 31 or 33, or both. Any of the odds, 35 to 49, either 51 or 53, or both. Any of the odds, 55 to 63, 65 to 73, 75 to 87, either 89 or 91, or both. Either 93 or 95, or both. And then... Any of the odds, 97 to 103. You pick the ones closest to your major, I would say. We'll wrap this up next time.